Hello and welcome to this lecture on the general data model for socioeconomic metabolism. I'll give a brief introduction on the problems we face when it comes to data sharing in industrial ecology and then explain the data model in detail. I'll close with pointing to a prototype for an industrial ecology community database that I recently developed and that is built on this data model. In industrial ecology we have many fantastic databases available. We have MRIO models, we have material flow, accounting databases, and of course we have the different LCA databases. But there are many more data sets that are not shared, that are hidden in some supplementary materials, some web pages, or maybe just in some spreadsheets that are lurking around. So there's a huge wealth of data within the community and outside from statistical agencies and so on that are difficult to retrieve and that take a lot of effort to put in our models. So there's definitely some room for improvement and also some efficiency to speed up research so we can spend less time on finding and formatting data and spending more time on analyzing them. One of the main barriers to data sharing is the lack of a community-wide data model or data format. I don't mean the LCA and MRO data formats, they are very specific, I mean something more general and you'll soon see what this is about. And of course there are lacks of incentives, but I think once you have a good infrastructure and a platform to share data, this will definitely reduce the threshold for sharing and for reusing data. So we need to establish a data sharing culture to make our research more cumulative so that it's easier to build upon each other's research and so it becomes more timely and also more relevant. So how does it work? If you look at the different methods, it all boils down to the same thing. We all describe the industrial system. We describe flows, trade flows, production flows, consumption flows, resource flows, emissions. We describe stocks and we describe the processes, the efficiencies, the inventories and so on. So at the very basic level, we have the concept of the system definition. And the system has a boundary, it has processes in their stocks and flows. And the data that we deal with in industrial ecology has three components. The first is of course the actual values, like 2000 kilotons or something, or 50,000 megatons per year. But these values don't mean anything unless they are located in the system. So I need to put the number and say, okay, this is a flow from this process to that process, or this is an efficiency of this flow into that flow in that process, and so on. I need to put the data into a system context to make them meaningful. And I need metadata such as the provenance or the version of the data, and so on, the licensing, those also need to be recorded. The aspect we're dealing with here is the location of the data in the system, because this is what makes industrial ecology data special. And here we need to first understand that the systems we deal with have different dimensions. The most common ones are of course the time and the location dimension. So we have a system that exists maybe from 1980 when the data started to 2050 when my forecast ends. And it has a location dimension, maybe I do a study on China, so the regional scope would be China. It has a process dimension because within our system we have different processes, maybe the steel industry or supply chain of plastics or something. In the different processes, we also have different objects. Maybe we have crude oil, we have refined oil, we have ethene, we have polyethylene, and so on. And we have waste plastics. So we had we trace uh, a certain element like carbon through its life cycle, and it takes the shape of different products or objects. Objects is a very general categories for products, goods, materials, substances, commodity, waste, and so on. And finally, we have a layer dimension. We can quantify the system at different layers. We have the mass layer, energy layer, monetary layer, and some more. Now, how do the system dimensions relate to our data? And here we need to observe that the system dimensions can be linked to the data in multiple ways. The most famous example is maybe the flow. The flow always has a starting point and an end point. And in the system approach, the starting point has to be a process and the end point also has to be a process. That means that the process dimension appears twice. 
it appears as a starting process and as an end process. And I call the different uh, elements I need to describe the data in the system the aspects of the data. So the flow example, a flow has a node of origin aspect, it has a node of destination aspect, it has a commodity aspect, like what is it made of, and it has a time aspect. Another example is the stock. A stock only has one process related aspect. It's the process where the stock is in. So you can see that the different system dimensions appear in different ways in the different data sets. So the way they appear in the data sets is called the aspects and each data type, stocks, flows, lifetimes, material composition and so on, has a certain data model or a certain aspect structure that makes it meaningful. Here is an example, an overview of the common system dimensions we have and the data aspects that are commonly used. Another example I want to stress is the model time. Time can be the historic time for time series. It can also be the model time for a future scenario. It can refer to the age cohorts. It can refer to a time point, for example, when we measure stocks, or for a time interval when we measure flows. When we look at data, we always have to be clear what the different system dimensions exactly mean. What is the role of time in my data set? Is it a time point? Is it a time interval? What is the role of location? Is it a location where my data are in? Or is it two locations where the data come from? The, so the thing that the data describes come from and where they go to? This must always be made clear and I'll show examples further down. Here we have a very simple system definition and we have some typical data sets, stock flow, product lifetime, process extension coefficients that are used in material flow analysis and also lifetime cycle assessment that need to be allocated in the system. So let's take an easy example, let's take the product material content. That's crucial data we need, for example, to translate passenger vehicles into their copper content. So that's MFA research and of course also LCA inventorying research. And what we need in terms of aspects to, to locate this data in the system is we need the substance. So what material are we talking about? We need the goods. What is it that the material is in? And of course we need the age cohort, that means uh, the time when the product was made, so it's a specific product, not any, and where it was produced. And you can construct such data models for all the different data types, and you can specify what of the aspects are mandatory, those that are indicated with a star, and the ones that are optional, that sometimes are meaningful and sometimes are not. So each data type has a specific data model that helps us to put those data into the system definition. How many different data types are there? There's quite many of them, but they can be grouped. They can be grouped into two dimensions. The first one is what we call extensive and intensive properties. The extensive properties are the ones that are at scale. For example, total number of people, total number of vehicles, total mass, total energy. And the other ones are per unit properties or intensive properties. These are, for example, the material content per unit or the energy requirement per output. So these are relative data that are always quantified in relation to another quantity. The second dimension, here the column dimension, is whether we want to describe the objects of interest in the system, the goods, the products, the waste, the commodities, and so on, or the processes. And the when you do that general divide, you end up with four major classes, extensive objects, properties, extensive properties, and intensive objects, and intensive process properties. Now the extensive objects can be divided further into stocks and flows. This is how we see the objects in their extensive appearance in the system, either a stock or a flow. And there's another category, this is the general ratios. You can of course take any two of these other 
data sets and put them in relation. For example, per capita stock is such a one. It doesn't fit any of the others because it's a ratio of other categories. So we are left with six generic data categories and under these categories we can then identify typical examples. Let's take the examples of the intensive object properties. So this is object property per unit. Best example is product material composition. So the content per unit of product, product lifetime, or the price or the specific energy consumption. To make this a bit more formal, we want to define the data model for socioeconomic metabolism. Everything I'm saying here is taken from a journal paper that is currently under review with the Journal of Industrial Ecology, and here I just present the main messages. The first one is that we say that each data item which is a number that quantifies effect in a system, requires a minimum number of aspects to be meaningfully located in the system dimensions. And each data type, whether it's stock, flow, material, content, and so on, has a specific data model that says which aspects are required and which aspects are optional to locate those data meaningfully in the system definition. We'll take an example from each of the six groups we identified above. Let's start with the flow. The flow is an example of category one. A flow is an extensive system arrival that describes the relocation of objects. And there's something kind of a uh, notation here that I commonly use to identify the aspects in a natural language sentence. And this is the aspects are always in brackets here. So the flow of objects from process A in region of origin to process B in region of destination in the time pairs is a certain value plus uncertainty for a certain layer. So every so this is a sentence that can be communicated across models and across research. This is common language, but it's structured. And we take those elements out, flow, object, process A, and so on, and these are the aspects. So the different aspects form a natural language sentence and this sentence can be communicated and the aspects can be stored in the database. This is how the thing works. There's a similar example for stocks. You can read it yourself. Just pause the lecture. We have examples for categories three and four. These are the intensive properties. The product lifetime is the lifetime of a good of a certain age cohort in a certain process in a certain regions has a certain value for a certain layer. The layer here is, of course, time. Process yield factors, the same process capacities or per capita stock, it's also the same. How does it now look in practice? What we do is we take the data and we split the data into the actual data table that links the numbers to the aspects and the description of the data. The description of the data are put into the data set table and here you see an entry. It's too small to read. I just go through the major groups of information that we have here. The data set table describes the actual data. Each data set, for example, the lifetime of products from a certain study or the flow of the trade flow of passenger vehicles between countries, each of these data sets has an ID and a description so that people can understand what it means. Then, and this is crucial, comes the aspect structure. So for each data set, we specify the aspects that are needed to put the data into the system. And then we have the metadata, where the data are, come from, are coming from and who extracted them. The actual data are put in the data table. The data table is a list of tuples. And the list of tuples describe the aspects expressed by the classification items. For example, you have an aspect material that can be steel, copper, and so on in a certain commodity that can be passenger vehicle for a certain region and age cohort with a certain value and unit. What you see here is, is an example of a material composition. And you would look up the corresponding information in the data set table to understand how these different aspects relate to each other to form this natural language sentence. In this case, the sentence would be 
the material content of material steel in commodity passenger vehicles in region global in H cohort 2000-2010 is this value and this unit. So this is how we translate the more abstract data model into a specific data structure. The whole database then looks like this. We have at the core, of course, the data table. The data table has two links. It links to a data set. So each number is part of a data set that comprises all data of the same kind. And the data also link to the classification items like steel, China, world, CO2, and all these different things. They are specified and they are defined. So we can always link uh, different data sets via their common classification items. Data sets can be part of data groups. For example, different stocks and flows of a system definition are then grouped into one common project. And the data sets, of course, link to the aspects that we need to define and to the data types. The whole database has 17 tables. Most of them are lookup tables where we look up different provenance types or different users. And the core structure is shown here in this figure. And I invite you to have a look at the prototype that is built on this database model. It is hosted on our virtual machine. And here we want to show how data storage and exchange and sustainability science could look like in the future. Some of the building blocks of the infrastructure we need for better data exchange have already been developed and we are now dependent on your feedback to see how useful it is, how clear it is, and how we should move this forward. So thank you very much for your attention, and I hope this clarification of data structures and data types, and also the implementation of the data model in an actually working database will be useful for the community and for the wider research in the future. Thank you.